Welcome to a special crossover episode of the industry-leading Catalyst Health, Wellness, and Performance Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Bradford Cooper, and we were incredibly honored to have Drs. Janice and James Prochaska, who developed the world-shifting stages of change model. Join us for our 100th episode of the podcast. We've never done this before, but we thought for an event this special, we'd give it a try and we hope you enjoy it. What follows is an unedited version of our conversation as a bonus for our subscribers here on the YouTube coaching channel. If you just happen to find this randomly, please consider subscribing down below. That'll give you easy access in the future. If you prefer the fine-tuned audio version, you can find that on our Catalyst Health, Wellness, and Performance podcast as our 100th episode. It'll go live June 10th, 2020. We'll provide a direct link to that below, or you can access it via any podcast outlet. Thank you again for joining us. If you have any questions, you can reach out to us at results at catalystcoachinginstitute.com or access a number of resources on the website at catalystcoachinginstitute.com. Please enjoy this special crossover episode. Now on to the unedited interview video version with Dr. Janice and James Wachaska on this episode of the Catalyst Health, Wellness, and Performance Podcast. I want to know how the goose hit him. <laughs> well, that's for a later interview. That's for you interviewing me. <laughs> All right. Well, it is such, such a privilege to welcome the Prochaskas today, Dr. Janice and Dr. James Prochaska. Most of you know them. They've had a huge impact on our field, on our industry, on, on many people far beyond that. You've heard my introduction. The two of you, thank you so much for joining us. Special 100th edition. And it's just a, such a pleasure to have you today. Well, special for us, too. Well, I appreciate it. Um, so behavior change, it's at the heart of so much in life. Maybe a good place to start would be discussing a difference between why people think they're failing to change versus the real reason they're failing to change. Well, first of all, most people have an action model of behavior change, and they believe that change happens when they quit smoking, when they quit the uh, uh, alcohol, when you put junk food, uh, and so uh, they end up with uh, attributions like, I don't have enough willpower, because mm. okay? that's an action paradigm. I gotta will it. Uh, uh, I don't have enough motivation. Uh, and, and those kind of uh, attributions are demoralized. Mm. You know, if I don't have enough will- willpower, why should I try? If I don't have enough motivation, Maybe I'll wait till I hit bottom, which is, I mean, what an awful philosophy that is. Right. It's so common. I think think the thing is, too, most people don't know how to change. And that's what we've really been working to help people to learn how to change. Well, that's the exciting part about the stages is it literally gives you those steps. You, you, don't, have to, you don't have to guess anymore. You, you can literally say, where am I? Okay, there I am. Now what is the next process, piece, of the, piece of the puzzle? Yes. Yeah. And what's great about it, it's, it's inclusive. You know, I mean, 40% of the people with the biggest risk behaviors are in pre-contemplation. Yeah. But most programs leave them out or exclude yeah. them. Yeah. And you can get a higher rate of return if you just stay with the 20% that are most prepared. Uh, but, you know, you exclude 80% of the people. Yeah. Yeah. So true. So true. All right. So the trans theoretical model of behavior change, first of all, really cool name. Uh, But the more common term stages of change, that's probably the one people recognize more. Did you have any idea when you first published this research back in, I think it was 83, that it would have this level of impact 37 years later? What kind of walk us through what that journey has been like? Well, believe it or not, as soon as we discovered uh, stages of change, you know, just interviewing like 50 ordinary people, I grew up in a factory neighborhood and I knew the wisdom of ordinary people. But what, what I had been working on was how could we take this fragmented area of counseling and psychotherapy that just had so many different approaches, how we could reintegrate the processes of change that are used. And when uh, we heard that with our third ear, it's like, whoa, this is a, a new paradigm. You know, this is going to be a, a scientific revolution. So. You know, and then it's like, whoa, the anxiety, you know, (laughs) not not a burden of responsibility to, to, you know, make it so it's available to people. Wow. Wow. Jim was interviewing people who had stopped smoking on their own. 
And when he would say, well, what were you doing? What, what helped you? And they said, it depends. It depends when they mm. were in the process of working on changing it. Yeah, so like we would say, uh, did you reinforce yourself for the steps you were taking? He said, yeah, yeah, that's more when I was quitting. Uh, did you take and look to understand more in terms of about your uh, uh, smoking and all? Well, that was early on. Mm. And so, you know, again, listening with the third ear of the clinician, you know, we heard them talking about stages. And then it was like, that's the missing link. That pulls wow. it together. Wow. Wow. So you, you did have a sense right out of the gate. You felt like this could be something that will help for generations. Yes. And, and our first article, I mean, it, it, was, it, it was basically based on those 30 people. And uh, it was American psychologists. And I'm proud to say out of 10,000 studies on uh, tobacco across all fields, that's the number one article most cited. Wow. Wow. That tells you something right there. So we, we provide our listeners with a brief overview of the sixth stage of the change from your book. And I've got it right here, Changing to Thrive, uh, during the introduction. So they have the foundation and they can rewind and hear it if they're going, wait, what were those again? Uh, are there common misconceptions about one or more of the stages that now might be a good time to help clarify? Yeah, so one of the most common is that people in pre-contemplation don't want to change. Mm. And uh, when you look in terms of, you know, millions of Americans have tried to lose weight too many times in too many ways, their history says they want to change, but they get demoralized about it and, and give up on it. Um, with contemplation, uh, they'll be seen as procrastinators, just putting it off, you know, someday I'm going to change kind of thing. Well, they're characterized by profound ambivalence. The pros and cons of changing are absolutely tied. And, you know, with Wall Street, you know, and, and so they have real doubt, is it worth it, is it not? But when you talk about Wall Street, you know, if you have doubt, you don't act, you know, you don't invest. And so... Uh, Again, it's, it's like attributing to them things from an action paradigm that they're making the mistakes about. But once they start to learn and they get that, you know, we say the first thing you have to change if you're going to change your life is change your mind and change your mental model. You have, if you have an action paradigm, you know, that's going to get in your way a great deal. And once they get it, it's like, wow, how come nobody ever taught me that? Wow. Wow. I that think, too, what can happen is that a health coach, once they get their person they're working with to action, figures, mm -hmm. oh, got my work done. And the reality is that there's a lot of work that needs to happen to stay in action. And the importance of, of really working hard for at least six months so that you can get to maintenance. So there the coach really needs to stay with the client and really help them use the processes of change that are important to use when you are working to stay in action. I love that you brought that up because so often we hear from coaches, well, do I work with someone for a month? Do I work with them for, you know, three sessions? Do I? And, and our model has always been, it's a relationship. It, it's a lifetime. It, you know, you, you may work with them for, in some cases, it might only be a, a year period, but in often, oftentimes it can be five, six, seven, eight years because life's a moving target. And so it's encouraging to hear you talk about that process and the time it takes and those kinds of things. Um, so interesting. You, you've spoken about the inaccuracy of the 21 day myth. We always hear that around, especially around January and New Year's resolutions and all in terms of habit formation. And as you just said, Janice, it, it's probably closer to six months. 21 days makes for a lot better headline. Why, <laughs> why, why is it, or how did you discover that the six months is so much more accurate than the 21 days? And does anything of value really happen in that first 21 days? That 21 days comes from uh, research uh, John Norcross, former student myself, did on New Year's resolutions. And what we found was that about 50% of the people relapsed in the first 21 days, in the first three weeks. And so media always wanted uh, New Year's uh, stories. And so they uh, interpreted it as, oh, so 50% uh, uh, relapse in the first 21 days, the rest are successful. Ah. <laughs> no, the relapse curve keeps coming down. And, 
and it doesn't level off, flatten out until around six months. And that's why we also talk about action as six months because we want to see that flattening out. You know, just like with the epidemic, we want to see flattening out in terms of number of infections and all, right. and before we take other action. So is that, have you seen when people step into the, utilizing the stages of change that that timeline is sped up a little bit or are there certain places where you say well if, if you step in and you're already at the preparation stage you're probably looking at three months or do we need to be in that action section for that six month period well the six months you know is a guideline and it sure. in terms of with the flattening out uh but yes i mean people uh, typically, we're, we're not encouraging people to go to action unless they're in a preparation stage. Uh, but yes, yeah, some people can, can move more quickly. You know, it's like yourself as an athlete, you know. The more effort you put in, uh, the faster you can get through it. But we also don't want th people to feel like they're being pressured, you know, you know more quickly to get through it. Uh, and so it, it's, uh, there is an arbitrariness. But when we say, okay, like cholesterol, what level should we have? Well, that's arbitrary, but it's a guideline so right. that, you know, and we use this kind of thing. If you were going through life-saving surgery, would you give yourself six months to recover? Yeah, okay? exactly. Think of this as life-saving uh, behavior change. And would you look for support from other people, right? And would you look to do what you, you know, can to recover uh, more quickly and, and more easily? It's a great example. Um, okay, so as you're talking about this, I, I mentioned Susanna, our, our chief learning officer. She's the one that knows this so much better than I do. She jokes about certain people seem to race through, and she'll sometimes joke with me about, Brad, this is your issue, where you just like are, boom, the pre-contemplation, the contemplation, the preparation, and the action are all like squeezed into 12 minutes, and then all the time is spent on the action, the maintenance. Do you see the different almost like personality styles come out or backgrounds or histories where some people they sit in that pre-con phase for a really long time other people go from one to four in a matter of a minute and then they spend a bunch of time on the, the last three what any patterns with that that you can give us some insights on well um i mean typically uh the, the, the biggest challenge we find within the stages of change is to help people get out of pre-contemplation. Okay. The action model says the biggest problem is relapse. Uh, but what we find is just moving out, you know, out of pre-contemplation, that's a small change, but it becomes a big change later on. Gotcha, gotcha. And, and, and tips on that? I've got a question a little bit later that we'll touch on this, but just some guidance on because some people are told if they're in pre-contemplation you just wait until they're ready and you would say no 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 so any tips for that person that is in that pre-contemplation phase how somebody can help them well first of all uh you know unfortunately the free quit lines for smoking mm -hmm. they're action oriented right. and when you call up you know you got, are you ready to set your quit date in the next uh, 30 days. <laughs> if not, call me back when you're ready. Right. Well, thanks a lot. Right. right. I mean, um, so uh, tell me in terms of the question. Just, you know, how to help somebody who's in pre contemplation. Oh. And I think one of the things that we often say is wherever you're at, we can work with that. And it's okay that you're in pre contemplation. And what we would like you to just consider is what your life could be if you weren't smoking all the time and you would become a, a non-smoker how would that be different for you and also to think in some of the advantages of not being a smoker yeah the latter what we know in the uh, meta-analysis of 125 studies from 10 countries nine languages that the pros of changing need to go up and so we might say you know share with me what, what, do you, what do you understand in terms of the benefits from regular exercise? And typically they'll give five or six. And then we'll say, you know, there's over 60 scientific benefits. And I wonder if you, if you would take on this challenge. See if you can double your list between now and the next time that we talk. 
Okay. So you you're not problem. giving them the list. You're not saying, here's the 60 reasons. You're asking them to start reflecting on those. Right. Now, uh, these days, you could say, well, you could go to Change into Thrive and you'll find out exactly. which ones are really important for you. And then when you check those, <laughs> you know, later on, you can use them, you know. This week, I'm walking for my heart. Next week, right. I'm walking for my depression. Then I'm right. walking for my grandkids. And, right. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Love it. So the reflection piece, that, that's a big deal. That's a big part of especially this pre-contemplative uh, stage is reflecting on my life, what I'd like it to look like, what it could look like, those kinds of things. Anything else you can flesh out in terms of reflection? Oh, I, I think uh, becoming aware, and, and one of the things we'll share with them is becoming aware that change is not action. Change is progress. And when you double your pros, you're progressing. You want to have feedback with that because you know, otherwise people can get demoralized in terms of if, if they're waiting until they take action, it, it can be hard to keep them with us. Right. We know, we, we, we show, we were able to predict over 90% of the dropouts from psychotherapy with therapists that were not stage-based, uh, and, uh, and it was that they were in pre-contemplation stage. So talk me through that a little bit. I, I, it's fascinating. So you can literally predict 90% of the folks that will drop out, and this was in a counseling setting, but it would probably be just as applicable to coaching based on the route that the counselor was taking, basically? Um, or based on where that individual was in oh, those oh, stages. Yeah, if, if, if they weren't seeing benefits, okay, if they weren't getting reinforcement, you know, feedback, hey, you know, congratulations, you doubled, you're progressing. It's, you know, it's like seeing your cholesterol come down. You don't expect them to go from uh, 300 to right. under 200, right? right? It's a gradual kind of thing, and that kind of progress. Otherwise, they'll discontinue the medication, just like they'll discontinue the uh, coaching. Wow. I, I love what you're talking about. Change is not action. I have like double lines here. Change is progress. We have a little saying we call hashtag better than yesterday. And it's the same concept that the goal is not to become you. The goal is not to become me. The goal for me is not to become Susanna. The goal is for me to be just a slight bit better than yesterday. And that's what you're talking about. Change is progress. That is so good. Uh, were you going to say something, Janice? Okay, that, thought I caught you there. Um, so midway through your book, you reference something called rule control, moving towards stimulus control. Can you flesh that concept out for us a little bit and how it applies to what we might be doing? Yes. Uh, um, rule control, when, when we're dealing with somebody with uh, a long-term habit, you know, or addiction or compulsion, but, you know, habits, uh, it's it's really under stimulus control, okay? It's like automatic. I mean, uh, I know with with myself, I you know, if I had ice cream and potato chips in the house, they were not going to last long, okay? So I had to take, and what's the stimulus in terms of what we'll eat? The most common stimulus for us is what's on the shopping list. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if I take that away, then, you know, so... Uh, but when in early on, the progress is more under decision control. Is it worth it? Is it not? Should I keep progressing? Should I put it off? And decision control is much weaker than rule control. And so uh, for myself, where I had some, some times where I had uh, trouble with my drinking, you know, I set a rule for myself. You know, I'll never drink more than three drinks, and that's a rule I could live by. Mm -hmm. I also had, uh, you know, trouble in terms of going into casinos. And so I would set a room for myself, leave my wallet in the car, take $20 in when I lose. I, you know. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> oh. so, and then you want to end up with stimulus control again. Okay, so, so it's three phases. So the behavior is, is much more automatic. Okay, so we've got decision, rule, No, stimulus. no, stimulus control. I'm sorry, stimulus control. Is that what you want to end up with? Yeah, that's what you want to end up with. That, that, that you know, now eating healthy is, you know, is much more, you know, automatic. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and in terms of drinking, how much to drink, you know, it's, it's like I don't have to make a decision about it. Uh, and I, I don't even have to worry about the rule. 
So the, so the process basically is essentially three levels. It's decision control, which is the weakest, rule control, which provides you some self-guidelines, and then stimulus is when it's essentially natural for you. Yeah. I mean, Janice is, uh, she takes us out hiking and, and we, you know, we do a lot of walking and hiking and she's got a stimulus, you know, the app, it's got to get to 10,000 steps. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. So those obviously overlap, like, for example, I'm training for a triathlon and I'll have a rule that I want to get about two hours a day in. And that allows me to not have too much waiting for me on the weekend. If I get up early, get on the bike by five thirty or whatever. Um, can the rule control, I don't find it hard to get that going. It's just a guideline for me. Do you find those overlap with things that people are doing? Is it a, a, a mobile kind of integration between those three or do they tend to generally be pretty succinct? Well, let me just say, I mean, you're the first one ever to ask questions about, you know, a stimulus control, rule control, uh, and, and just frankly, we have not done nearly the research on it, okay? It's but really it's, interesting. It's, it's, it's more, um, let's say, a, a, a kind of a, a metric that helps us in terms of, uh, so people, people can well, be more makes, confident. It makes sense. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it keeps under decision control. Right. You know, I'm in as much risk of going backwards as going forward. Completely. And decisions are and really... depending on the day and how stressed you are yeah. or distressed. Did you, you sleep last decide. night? Yeah. 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 I love that. Excellent. Okay. So this question might fit into the pre-contemplation phase. So you can, you can tell me about it. But what about the person that you're talking to? They're maybe in an employee wellness program. So they're forced to talk to a coach or... You know, that's a parent talking to somebody and they say, you know, I'm good. I, I don't have any areas I want to change. For the coach who may be working with somebody like that, is there any value in moving forward or different questions you can ask to prime the pump a little bit? Or does this kind of create a brick wall, if you will, in terms of behavior change when they say, you know, I'm good. I'm fine the way I am. Well, a couple of things. Did you? Oh, go ahead, Al. Oh, uh, w one is, is that we would typically give the person uh, a health risk uh, intervention, okay, mm -hmm. not a health risk assessment. And that tells us where they are with uh, like the mm -hmm. big four plus one, the, the behaviors that account for the most uh, chronic disease and disability and lost productivity, premature death. Um, and so, uh, that can help us and then it shows what stage you're in and it can give feedback so that that's one of the tools yeah with with hopefully not being too sarcastic <laughs> like one idea is wow you must be in the top three percent of our population in other words you don't smoke you don't drink more than one drink a day mm -hmm. if you're a woman you um, walk 10,000 steps you do some stress reduction about 20 minutes a day and you eat five fruits and vegetables a day wow you're amazing <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're you're a behavioral athlete that's right I mean, <laughs> but the other thing though more seriously i do really feel that financial incentives can can work mm -hmm. it i can agree work for those folks uh, we, we have an article where we uh, compared our clinical trials to uh, the standards found from Centers for Disease Control across uh, oh, 55 studies for worksite uh, you know, health uh, wellness programs. And um, we then also had our case study where this was with a nationwide uh, company and they had financial incentives. In this case, it was uh, and health insurance is going up. If you participate, your insurance won't go up. Right. And what we showed was, is that they were outperforming the other, you know, those 50 some companies by far, and they were outperforming our best uh, results as well. We've also just uh, completed a study where uh, the financial incentives just uh, produce outcomes that we've been trying to do for decades. So, and, you know, I, I'd like the fact you've got a, a a PhD in performance science. Okay. Well, what we do is, you know, it's like you have your personal best. Can you outperform yeah. your personal best? 
Well, now we're saying we shouldn't be worried about outperforming no treatment or a placebo. Can we outperform our best? Mm -hmm. Okay. And when we do that, then we know we have something really worth writing about and disseminating. I love that. So, and that, that fits perfectly. And I think that can prime the pump in a lot of ways. What about that person that just says, yeah, I'm overweight or I don't walk much or yeah, I know my cholesterol is high. I just don't care. Like, I'm just fine with life. Just, can you just leave me alone? Like, is that, are we not even entering the stages of change here? They're not even pre-contemplating at that point, or are there some things you can do in that case that, that might just help the process? Well, uh, in Europe, they came up with a, a stage before pre-contemplation. They call it emotive, and we use that sometimes. That is without motivation. Uh, mm. But, uh, and, and I, I might say, you know, my usual rule is I won't care about uh, uh, somebody's health and well-being more than what they care. Okay? But I want to let you know, I mean, I do care. And, and uh, I... I'm not going to coerce you. I'm not going to pressure you. I will want to help influence you. And so I will respect where you're at. And if you continue to not want to change, I'll stay with you. <laughs> like that. I love that wording. I love that. That's excellent. Okay. So page 43 of your book, you state, and here's a little quote, our goal is to be a positive influence without becoming a negative source of pressure. That is so well said. I don't know if you guys spent three hours on that one sentence, but that is, a, <laughs> that is a beautiful sentence. For the coach, the counselor, the clinician, the parent, the friend, whoever it is listening to this, what guidance can you provide that will help us walk that line? Because that's a fine line. That's a tough line. You, you want to be that positive influence without feeling like you're creating this negative pressure, which obviously can send people the other direction. Walk us through that a little bit. That is so beautiful, but how do we walk that line? Well, again, one, you know, we talk about the, one of the first processes is to increase awareness. Well, I, I want to you know, help uh, increase the awareness about the difference between coercion and influence. And the thing that uh, as a coach or as a parent or as a partner that we need to be aware of, if somebody is in pre-contemplation, they're likely to, to experience what we're saying as coercion. And so I'd like to be open It's you know, I, I, I will, do not want, and let me know. It reminds me of this uh, fellow who was in with a drug problem, marital problem, uh, career problem. And I said to him, you know, if you feel me uh, pressuring you uh, to do things that you don't want to do, will you let me know? He says, I'll let you know. I said, how will you let me know? He says, I'll get angry as hell. I said, well, I can work with that. What I can't work with is you're not coming back. Yeah. And so, um, again, to, to, be, to be saying, because typically you'll get signs, you know, they'll back up, you know, they'll go quiet, you know, they'll show the signs of you know, defensiveness. And, and I might reflect, you know, I feel like I'm making you feel defensive. I feel like you might be feeling pressure. And again, uh, I'm respecting where you're at. But I, I do want to influence you because I think that can make a, a difference in your life. And, and I don't want to waste this opportunity. It's good. So many good tips here. Uh, all right. So on page 259 of your book, and folks are going to have to take a look at this, uh, you've got something called a life evaluation uh, as a figure. The feeling today versus the functioning today I, I thought that was really interesting, and I, and I think it's a very, very valuable distinction. Can you tell us a little bit more about how and why that specific tool was developed and how you've utilized it? Is it okay to do an open book? Yeah, test? absolutely. <laughs> I got my book. That's open. true. I can't expect you to know what page 259 is, can I? <laughs> I say, you know the book better than I do. I'm uh, well, um, one of the things that we found was that uh, when we assess people on a, a scale of uh, one to ten, um, and, and on two questions, how am I feeling today and how am I functioning today, we found that the higher they were, uh, the further in the stages they were likely to be, or the more practice they were, uh, progress they were likely to make, and what we like is to try to get it down to, you know, like two questions. 
months. Uh, and it's a good way to track progress because, yeah. you know, if, if they're saying, I mean, look at today in terms of people, how many people are feeling well, right? Oh my gosh, how many people are functioning well? You know, I mean, it's like the world collapsed on them. Yeah. And, you know, if they were starting to, in terms of assess, okay, what am I going to do to help me increase how I'm feeling, and to help me increase how I'm functioning, then, you know, it, that also helps counter the helplessness that uh, so many uh, are feeling. And I hate feeling helpless. And, sure. and Helpless is a major cause of uh, depression and uh, distress. So having that, you know, like, you know, in the other ways that we take a temperature right on a thermometer and we hope it's not, uh, you know, over 101, but here we're taking the temperature of feeling and functioning and we want that to, you know, to be gradually improving it means I'm also, I'm not feeling so helpless. And is the functioning piece, I I'm just imagining... I'm trying to put myself in this situation and some examples, but with the functioning piece, the longer I've been doing it, the further along in the stages I am, the more consistent the functioning is, regardless of what the feelings are today? Well, let's just say there certainly are times where we get a fever, right? We don't want it at these times. But, right, right, right. Uh, okay, so there are times. There are times. I mean, uh, you know, Clearly, there are times where we're going to be uh, distressed and, and we're not going to function as well. I mean, frankly, we, we shouldn't be putting pressure on ourselves right now to be functioning as well as we would in a different uh, world. And, and so, we can, you know, it's more like a, the acceptance that, yeah, and I'm not feeling as well. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that that's, can be very much healthy. But if I'm progressing, and doing some things. Jen, you have some questions about in terms of like what are you doing? Oh, we um, had some quarantine questions that uh, a psychologist was sharing with us. And a couple of those questions that are, are very helpful, I think. What are you doing to move today, to move your body today? And what are you doing to bring some beauty into your life, either creating it or seeing it? going out and experiencing it and those kinds of things again can help you feel better which in turn can help you function better and to, and to really in a sense improve your well-being just as a side uh, to share with you uh the, the behaviors that we you know emphasize the most the big four plus one you know smoking alcohol abuse unhealthy eating and all it turns out that a researcher from Stanford is being able to measure to um, measure our biological age for immune system and then our functional age for immune system. And so I could have uh, age 60 and my immune system is like a healthy 40 year old yeah. functioning well. Or I can have it like an 80 year old, the more distant. And what are the behaviors that affect the immune system? It's the same ones we use, uh, uh, you know, for chronic disease prevention. Right. And which right. are so important right now to ward off yeah. uh, COVID-19, yeah. to have a better immune system so that we wouldn't be as susceptible. And, but it, it also, it, it, it prevents more of the worst parts of the, the uh, uh, virus because, you know, so many people have the virus but no symptoms. Right. And right. so it, it's, you know, it's more the, the, uh, the sickness and, and the really the worst parts of it. Right. Uh, because then your, your immune system is helping you to keep from getting to the worst. And it, it's why, you know, people with, you know, in New York, they found people had two chronic conditions that died. I mean, it was, you know, the average. In the U.S., as Jan was indicating, 90% uh, have uh, two or more of the big four plus plus one yeah. and so it's like you know that's why when she was saying if this person doesn't have any of those it's great know, we should give them a trophy <laughs> <laughs> totally so i'm looking at what we were talking about with the decision rule and stimulus control and i'm, I'm trying to lay that over the top of the feeling today functioning today it, it seems like the more you are in the on the scale if, if decision rule and stimulus is a scale if 
we're further to the decision side of trying to make this, you know, choices in our, our daily life, then the feelings are going to cause that to vary all over the place. Whereas if we're in the stimulus control, the feelings won't have as much of an influence. Am I hearing that correctly? Am I making that overlap accurately or are they really very distinct? Well, no, I, I like that. I, I like that. Remember, you're quizzing me about stuff that I... <laughs> I love having data when I answer questions. I understand. I understand. So then I got to turn to, to reason and feelings. Uh, but, um, you know, the further I am in terms of, you know, in terms of stage, in terms of stimulus control, the better I'm likely to be functioning. You know, if, if I am, you know, really stuck on making decisions, you know, is it worth it, is it not, you know, like in literature, dare I eat a peach, you know, it's like, with those kind of decisions, you get stuck, you know, yeah. and, and you're not functioning well, and you're not, not feeling well. Analysis paralysis, is that what they call that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. good. Chronic contemplators. Yeah, yeah, I have not heard that one. I like that. I like that. I'm gonna, well, I'm that's, that's a... That's what I accuse Freudians of being, crown of contemplation. <laughs> <laughs> I might steal that one. I love it. All right, let's have some fun with this next one. We just got two questions left. Uh, you've been married 54 years as of this September, if I did the math right. There cannot be a better testimonial to the value of the whole trans theoretical model of change than that. Any fun stories about the role it's played either in your marriage or raising your kids or combination of the two? Well, keep in mind, we were in love and we were married before we discovered the stage. <laughs> so so we, we, we didn't uh, you know, need that. I would say, I mean, for, for myself, um, you know, I have felt blessed all my life, you know. I don't know how and I don't know why. Uh, but in spite of whatever the uh, discoveries I've had and the recognition, uh, that does not make me privileged, okay? You know, privilege means uh, I'm entitled to whatever I want. Yeah. Being blessed, being blessed means I have responsibility to give back, you know, to give back personally, to give back professionally, and to give back like your coaches will do, to be, you know, helping people to be happier and healthier. Love that, love that. I, I, I get a kick out of uh, my friends using the stages of change. And <laughs> one of my friends says, you know, I'm really in preparation to buy a couch, but my husband's in pre-contemplation. So I need to, oh. I, I need to outline to him all the benefits that a new couch would do for our marriage and our home and our living room. <laughs> and I need to reduce all the cons. <laughs> put it in the way of him moving to contemplation and preparation. So it's, it. a, it's fun to hear other people use it in, in that kind of way. You know, I used to do a lot of marital therapy and, uh, and with an audience I'd say, okay, I have a husband and wife come in for marriage counseling. What stage is the husband in? And the audience will yell out pre-contemplation. <laughs> and what stage is the wife in? action okay and what are the attributions they make you know he is so stubborn like a mule you can't get him to change and what does she he say about her she is so controlling and and then i say let's maybe understand that you're in different stages of change okay and that's a place where you might find some common ground to be able to pull together more so sometimes we use that in our marriage as well i love that (laughs) Do do you catch each other almost overusing it? Like I'll I'll accuse Susanna because she's so good. She just so naturally good at all this intrinsic motivation, motivational interviewing, stages of change, all those kinds of things. I'll sometimes accuse her as using her Jedi mind power tricks on me. Um, (laughs) Do do the two of you see that joke with each other? Kind of look at each other. Go not today, honey. That's not. You can't use that one. I don't think so. No, you know, like being a clinical psychologist and stuff, you know, at social gatherings, people say, oh, no, you're going to read my mind, you know, you're going to analyze me. No, I, you know, I don't do that with my family. I don't do that with my friends. You know, I do it myself, but sure. I do it with clients, you know, who are, are, are encourage me to do that. How about something going on in your lives now? You've, you've started this whole thing again, how many years did I say 37 years or so ago? 
Um, is there something in your life now that you're, we're all works in progress that you're working on and you're kind of see yourself moving through those stages of change right now with something? Well, not long ago, Janice took me to a, a meeting uh, to support friends of eight people with a nutritionist leading it. And he goes and, and he's, uh, you know, showing in terms of here's what you can eat in the first week. And I'm saying, oh, no, what has Janice got me into? <laughs> An elimination kind of diet. Yeah, 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 yeah. I said, all I can eat is things I don't like, you know. Well, I, I, I went with it. And, you know, and believe it or not, I mean, my goal became to get free from uh, my sugar addiction. Mm. But without intending to, I, I lost 10 pounds. Wow. It stays off. I lost two inches around the, you know, the tire on my stomach, which wow. is the most important place. And it's yeah. like, you know. At 77, you can continue to change. You can continue to improve your health and your well-being. Love it. Love and it. the nutritionist gave us many, many rules that we had to abide okay. by for six or seven weeks. But then they became more stimulus sure. controlled because, you know, we saw that eating the sugar just wasn't a good thing. Is is one particular change. Nice. That is, that's great. Love it. All right. Last question, just wide open. Take this any direction you'd like. Both of you, any final words of wisdom for those who are looking to help either improve their own lives or maybe their coaches, counselors, physicians that are trying to help people around them. And, and I should throw parents and friends in there too. Well, I, I, I would say in terms of uh, the wisdom for my own life is uh, by Put friends and family first, okay? Put fun and playing and games first, okay? Uh, a friend from uh, Princeton professor taught me, put your tennis and your golf into your date book first. Your work won't find, have any problem finding this way. Yeah. Big rocks first, yep, love that. And you know, I really liked your signature thing, optimized reality. Thank you. I love that as a concept, and I, I, I really identify with that and think how important it is even now with COVID-19 and all this yeah. sheltering in place, how to optimize the reality as much as possible rather than giving up, throwing up your hands and giving up and not doing anything much at all. Yeah, beautiful. Well, you two, this was such a pleasure. Thank you for taking the time. I know everybody probably wants to have you in their corner and walking them through this process and help them understand it. But you've had such a huge impact and, and it's truly an honor to have you join us. Well, great, great being with you. And, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll be a little bold here. If, if you like what you heard, you can follow up and, uh, and lots of folks are telling us it really, really is, uh, you know, making such a difference personally you know, and professionally. So. Oh, absolutely. Excellent book. There's no doubt about it. And we'll, add the title we've mentioned it here in the interview and i'll add it to the uh, intro exit as well so they have easy access to it but thank you so much fantastic job and again great honor well good being with you and all the folks we can't see and Perfect. thank you for your enthusiasm it's yes. great i appreciate that thanks so much okay i know